In this video, we're going to show how to manage a database schema from within code so we don't have to worry about versioning our database, or, or manually I mean, and moving our tables manually from development to production, and all that stuff gets so messy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a really, really slick way of managing our database from within code. Now, I'm going to go open up my MySQL Workbench, and I'm connected already to my local web server, or local database server. This program comes with the default MySQL package, so if you install MySQL, it'll come with Workbench. Now, the first thing I have to do is I have to actually create this database that we're going to be connecting to. So I'm going to hit this button up here to create a schema, and I'm going to manually set the coalition to UTF-8 General Unicode Case Insensitive or sorry, UTF-8 Unicode case insensitive. Uh, I believe that's already my default coalition, but I've never checked and I've always just manually clicked on the little button. Just to make sure, you always want to use uh, UTF-8 Unicode CI. Uh, this just is a coalition which is used to determine um, how strings are processed. If you want to support things like Chinese characters and other things that aren't in the English language, you will definitely want to use some form of UTF-8. So now that I've done that, I'm going to name this schema simple blog because that's a very <laughs> inspiring name. And I'm going to go ahead and hit apply. It's going to tell me what SQL it's going to run against the server. And I'll just hit apply again and finish. Now we'll see simple blog down here. And if I open it up, we'll notice that there are no tables in it. Now you might be saying, well, let's go ahead and start creating table. Let's right click here, hit create table and start filling out columns and no. We're not going to do that, and don't do that. That was a very emphatic no. Well, the thing is, is we, like I ex talked about earlier in the other video, we do not want to manage our schema manually. We do not want to manually create tables and columns and foreign keys and all that fun stuff. Why? Because it becomes impossible to version. It means we now have an external dependency on another piece of software that's configured in a particular way, and the way that that software is configured is not under source control which is problematic for sharing your code between teams, and it's also problematic for launching your code into production. So we're not going to do it this way. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to write code that will be checked into source control and manage our schema for us. That does sound a lot slicker. Indeed it is. So I'm going to close out of my SQL Workbench, or just minimize it, and I'm going to go to References, and I'm going to add a NuGet rec uh, reference in the Online tab, to Fluent Migrator. Now, Fluent Migrator is a product that allows us to manage the database schema inside of our code, which is exactly what we want. I'm going to hit install. Okay, so we have Fluent Migrator, but it hasn't actually done anything, as is, you know, normal for... Usually the case, yeah. Right. So we need to write some code that Fluent Migrator can pick up on and manage our database for us. But let's take a step back, and I'm going to right-click on Simple Blog and say uh, blah, Open Folder in File Explorer. And I'm actually going to show you guys the, the tool we're going to be using to manage our schema. It's going to be located under our solution, which is Simple Blog, not our project Simple Blog, our solution. It's going to be under Packages, Fluent Migrator, tools, and then we'll see right here a migrate.exe. This is our migration runner. What this will do is if I execute this migrate.exe with the correct parameters, it'll search a, an assembly that I specify for special migration classes that are marked up with a special attribute. It'll then invoke those actions on the database. Now I think that an example here is in order because um, hopefully I'm not losing anyone yet. So let's go ahead and show how to do that um, and hopefully everything will come together. I'm excited. You should be. <laughs> how could I not be? <laughs> All right, in simple blog, I'm gonna create a new namespace called migrations. Inside of migrations, I'm gonna create a new class and I'm gonna call it 001 underscore users and roles. Now you might be looking at this uh, class name and wondering, you know, why is it underscore 001? And that is for sorting purposes. We're going to version, our migration, individual migrations are going to have 
be sorted in a way that they'll go from you know the 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 earliest migration all the way to the latest migration and so that's why I, I zero fill this one and I have to start with an underscore because class names can't start with numbers gotcha Okay, so how do we let Fluent Migrator know that this is a migration, and how do we, well, actually tell Fluent Migrator to, well, do anything? We do that through two things. The migration attribute and the migration base class. So we want to have this class inherit from migration. Now you'll see that we need to import a namespace, per usual. So I import that, and we now have using Fluent Migrator. Um, also, um, I had an S at the end of that. That just should be migration. Let's look at the attribute first. The attribute takes, a, um, well, two parameters, but the first parameter is the only one we care about right now, and that's the version. We're specifying to Fluent Migrator that this is the first migration. Fluent Migrator doesn't actually look at the name to find a number. This underscore 001 is my convention, just for sorting purposes. So we have to also tell Fluent Migrator which version our migrations are. Now you'll notice that we have some red squigglies, and that's just because the migration class comes with two abstract members that we have to implement. So let's go ahead and implement them. The two methods that we get that we need to implement are up and down. The up method is invoked when Fluent Migrator decides that it needs to, the database needs to be migrated up, or you need to do your modifications to the database. The down method is invoked when you roll back your changes to the database. So you should always fill out both method stubs. You should be able to provide a way to go up and a way to go down. That way you can go all the way up to an entirely fully featured database and then all the way back down to nothing. That is very important when a deployment fails for whatever reason and you need to roll back the changes made to the database. Okay, so how do we actually go about creating tables and, and columns and foreign keys and all that fun stuff? Well, we do that with the different static classes that are provided to us by Fluent Migrator, one of them being create. So I can say create dot table, give it a table name, which can be users, and now I'm creating a table. Now, the way that this syntax works is it's a fluent interface, meaning we commonly chain up a bunch of method invocations like you see here, and it sort of reads like a sentence, which is kind of neat. So we're creating our users table, but we need to give it some uh, columns. One of the columns we're going to need to do is our ID column. So let's go ahead and I'm going to specify the with column. So again, it's interesting to note that our migrator will give us this really, really, really fancy sort of fluent interface that we can use for, well, lots of fun stuff. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to say using with column, I'm going to give it the name of ID. I'm going to give it a type. So I'm going to say as int 32 dot identity dot primary key. What this means is this will create a table called users with a column ID that's an int32 data type. It's going to be the identity, um, which in Fluent Migrator terms and MSSQL terms means it's going to be an auto increment field. And it's also going to be the primary key of the table, which means this is going to be the identifiable attribute. Every single row will have a unique ID. Next up, we need to give it a couple more properties. We'll want to do with column username or users username as string with the size of 128. So what I'm saying is we want a username column that has that is a string and that is 128 characters long. Next up we want an email. So I want with column email as string and 128. Actually no, uh, let's do 256 because I believe 256 is the um, maximum length of an email. And then we'll also need to do a password hash. As string. Now we'll be talking a whole lot more about password hashes a little bit later because, well, password hashes are kind of a complex topic that needs to be addressed for, well, fairly obvious security reasons. So I'm just going to say as string 128. 
So now we have a users table. Let's not worry about building the roles table yet and just do the users table so we can demonstrate really quickly how the full process of migrating our database is going to work. However, because I wrote an up that creates a table, I need to write it down that deletes a table. So I'm going to say delete table users inside of my down method. Sound good? Sounds very good. Okay, so this is where things get fun. I'm going to make sure to hit F6 to build because I've changed a CS file, but I'm not going to open up the website. Instead, I'm going to go back into my migrate.exe and I'm going to write a little script that will invoke the migrate.exe in a way that will run this migration. You'll notice that we're actually kind of already missing something here. We're not telling Fluent Migrator what database to use yet, but we'll take care of that in a moment here. So I'm going to back back up into simple blog. Um, I'm going to execute this in the context of simple blog. The reason I'm doing that is so that we can just copy and paste the command I'm about to write and put it into a script that we can reuse later. So I'm going to open up PowerShell inside of this folder and I'm going to invoke migrate. So let's just see what this is. This isn't going to work quite yet, but let's just see what this, the syntax looks like to invoke the script. Well, I need to go back up one one level. I need to go into my packages folder. I need to go into my fluent migrator folder. Then I need to go to tools, then migrate. Okay, so that's the migrate command. If I just hit enter right here, it's just going to give me a bunch of options of what I can pass into it. So what parameters do we need to pass into it? Well, first of all, we need to tell it that the database is MySQL. So we do that with the DB flag equals MySQL. That'll instruct Fluent Migrator to what kind of SQL it has to generate given these expressions over here. Next up, we need to give it a target. The target is actually the, the uh, DLL that is compiled as a result of building this web project. So that is going to exist in bin slash simple, uh, hold on, bun. Ah, simple blog .dll. So that's our target DLL. Next up, we need to give it a path to our configuration. Because if I just hit enter now, look what we get. It says, unable to resolve any connection strings using parameters connection and config path. What does that mean? Well, it means it doesn't know what database that we're trying to actually perform the migration on. Now, there is a way within Fluent Migrator for me to specify that database from within this command, but that's not the way I want to do it. The reason that's not the way I want to do it is because then I'll have to repeat the connection string when I want to use something like in Hibernate or any other database access inside of my project. So the question then is, how do I configure a database that's tied to this project that can be used by both Fluent Migrator and in Hibernate? Well, the answer to that lies inside of our web.config. We can actually use web.config to specify what's called a connection string that represents the credentials and locations of a database server. To do that, we use the not surprisingly named connection strings element that will sit directly under configuration. So after my app settings, I'm going to write a connection strings element. And inside of connection strings, I'm going to add an add element with the name of main DB for main database with a connection string. So I'm simply adding a new connection string called main DB, and then I'm specifying what connection string that equals. Now, there are many different types of connection strings depending on the database you are connecting to, whether or not you're using internet integrated security or a password, and other options you might want to pass in. Right now, I'm just going to type out a very basic MySQL connection string, which is simply going to be server equals localhost semicolon database equals simple blog, which remember that correlates to this right here, our schema in the database. Then I'm going to put in a user ID. In this case, I'm going to be using root for production. You definitely don't want to do that. Next up, I'm going to put in a password. And my root password for my development MySQL server is Nelson. Alrighty. 
Okay. okay. Um, so now that we have our connection string in our web.config, we can go back into Fluent Migrator and we can tell it where to pull this connection string from so that it knows what database to perform its actions on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say dash dash config path equals web.config. Then I'm going to say dash c equals main db. So what I'm doing is I'm saying the configuration file is web.config and the connection string name that I want you to pull out of web.config is called main db. Now watch what happens when I hit enter. We get an error. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that's killer. I don't know why. Uh, me neither. Um, <laughs> config path. Let's try to uh, blah blah blah. It's saying con specified configuration path does not exist. Now, if I do an ls from here, we'll see that web.config does indeed exist. So a very a potential issue with this is a misspelling, because as we all know, config is not spelled c o n f g. Config is spelled C O N F I G. There you go. <laughs> okay, okay, we hit enter. And look what happened. Oh, it worked. So, what happened? Well, first of all, it said using connection main DB from configuration file. That's good. We're using the right database. Next, it, it did something that you might not have expected. See, Fluent Migrator needs to have data in the database that tells it how far the database has been migrated up or down. Because we want to be able to add migrations later and rerun this tool, we want the new migrations to be invoked, but the old ones to be ignored. So that means Fluent Migrator needs to have some data on the database to know how far the database has been migrated. That makes sense. Yep. And then it migrates its migration table, and then it invokes R migration which it says create table users 001 users and roles migrated task completed so now if I go back into my SQL right click and hit refresh all look at this we have tables we have two tables we have users and we have version info so if I look at users if I right click and hit alter table we see that we have an ID a username an email and a password hash now the email is unfortunately text. For some reason, um, our migrator decided to turn it into text instead of a varchar like it should have. So we'll fix that in a moment here when I show you guys how to do custom data types for Fluent Migrator. But then let, let's next look at our version info table. Our version info table has a version and an applied on to keep track of what migrations have been applied. Alrighty. So now We're if I back good. out of... You what? We're doing good. Yep. So now I'm going to back out, and I want to go down. The problem is, is that what happened here is I kind of messed up the migration. So I want to go migrate back down, change the migration, and migrate back up. If we scroll up to what happens when we invoke Fluent Migrator with uh, no parameters, we'll see that we have a way to tell it to go down or up. We do that with the T parameter and allows us to do things like migrate up, migrate down, roll back, roll back to version, roll back all, and so on and so on. What we want to do is we want to roll back. So to roll back, we simply invoke the same command we invoked before, but with dash T equals rollback. Hit enter and look what happens. It says, delete table users. Users and roles reverted, task completed. So what did it do to my database? Well, if we come back here and hit refresh, our tables are now gone. That's because it undid everything. That doesn't necessarily seem like we want in total. Well, it, it undid everything so that we can go back and fix the migration and then redo everything again. Remember, we have a problem with the email field. It's being set as a text data type and not a varchar data type. So what we want to do is we want to roll back the migration we made, fix it, and then roll it forward again. This is a very common practice during the development of migrations. However, there's a rule you have to follow. 
this development practice of rolling back and then rolling forward to fix a migration is not going to work after you've already deployed a migration to production. If you deploy a migration to production, you consider that migration set in stone and never to ever change again. Meaning, oh it, dear. once you send a, a, a migration to production, if you want to alter that migration at all, you need to write a new migration that just changes the specific things you need changed. It's important that you never modify one after it's committed. So we see that the email as string 256 has actually turned it into a text. We don't want that. We want a varchar 256. To fix that, I'm going to say with column email as custom varchar 256. Easy fix. I like it. All right. So now we come back here. We run the migration again. We don't run the rollback. We run the migration without the rollback. Hit enter come back into MySQL Workbench, refresh all, we see our users table, and if we come and alter the table, we see the email is still text. It's having a serious issue with this. Why is it doing this to me, Steve? Ooh, you know why this is doing this to me? I'm gonna leave this in the video. Guess what I forgot to do? I forgot to build. There you this happens a lot, um, as you see. So I'm going to build, it build succeeded. Remember, we have to build the DLL in order for Fluent Migrator to pick it up. So I'm going to roll back. I've rolled back. And then I'm going to run it again. I've gone forward. I'm going to come back into the thing, hit refresh all, close all my existing tabs because now those are out of date. Open up my users table. And we now see that email is a var char 256. Perfect. That F6 gets me every time. Yeah, it's really, every time. really, really a pain. I do it quite often. So I just want to stress the point that if your migration isn't working the way you expect it to, it's probably because you didn't build. OK. All right, excellent. Before we finish up the way that I want this migration to actually look, let's roll back one more time. Because I am now going to flesh out the user's table the roles table, the user role pivot table, and the related foreign keys. Sound like fun? It sounds large. <laughs> well, I don't know how else to put that. It'll be it fun. sounded like a lot to my poor little brain. <laughs> it'll be fun, don't worry. All right. OK, so we need to create a roles table because we want to keep track of which users have which roles. So I'm going to say create table roles with column ID as int32, identity, primary key. Then with column name as string, and let's just say 128. That's a nice string length. OK, so we have our users table and we have our roles table. So we, have, we can add in roles and we can add in users. Because I just created a table roles, I need to make sure that I delete it in the down. OK, now that I've done this, I need to create a pivot table that will relate roles to users. What does that mean? Well, we need to know which users have which roles, but a user can have multiple roles. We call this association many to many. Again, this isn't a database theory class, so we won't focus too much on, on that. But we will need to create our user roles table. So I'm going to create a table called users um, or roles, or sorry, role users is typically the, um, uh, the convention I follow. It's not going to have a primary key. Instead, it's going to have two columns, a user ID and a role ID. So what do we fill these in with? So we need to fill in both these column definitions with data types. User ID is going to be an int32. Why? Because that's the same data type as the user's ID column, which we're relating to. In addition, I want to set up a foreign key from this table to the other one. So I'm going to say foreign key. I'm going to give the primary key name, or the primary table name, to be users, and the primary column name to be ID. What does this mean? This means this, this column is going to have to be a valid user ID to be inserted. This practice is called referential integrity. 
means that the role users table cannot have a row in it that refers to an invalid user or user that doesn't exist. Next up though, I want to do one more thing. Um, hold on. Blah, blah, blah. We want to cascade. Now, what we want to do, ah, sorry. When we delete a user, I want all of their role users rows to be deleted. So we're going to say rule dot cascade on delete. So this says if a user is deleted, then delete the row and row users. And I'll show an example of that momentarily. Okay, so now we have to fill out our role ID. What are we doing? As in 32 with the foreign key. The foreign key is relating to the roles table with an ID column and it's going to have an on delete rule cascade. Finally, we have to make sure that we delete this table, role users. Now, this is where order is important. Because role users has two foreign keys on it, one relating to the users table and one relating to the roles table, we need to delete the role users table before we delete the roles or the users table. Because if we try to delete the roles table before the role users table, MySQL would throw an error saying that the role users table has a foreign key constraint that can't be removed until we either delete the foreign key constraint or delete the table that it's owned by. So now that we've done that, I'm going to go ahead and migrate up again. And guess what I forgot to do? I forgot to build. So I'm going to go ahead and migrate down again, come back into Visual Studio, build with F6, jump back into PowerShell, and migrate up. Check out what we got. We got create table users, create, create table roles, create table role users, and we created two foreign keys. Let's verify that everything looks the way it should in our database. I'm going to open and back up my SQL workbench and refresh all, and we'll see we have th three tables now, role users, roles, and users. I'm not going to, when I count tables, I'm not going to consider the version info really a table because it's only used by the migrator. Alrighty. If we open up role users, we'll see that user ID and role ID are foreign keys. We know they're foreign keys because of that little symbol. We can also look at our foreign keys tab and see that we indeed have two foreign keys and they're both set to cascade on delete. So let's start playing with some data so we can get a feel for how these foreign keys will work. Let's say I have a user. I'm going to go ahead and create a user. His username is going to be Nelson. His email is going to be Nelson at 3dbuzz.com. And his password hash is going to be whatever, because it doesn't matter. Then let's create a Steve for whatever reason. Scary things to create, but OK. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to hit Apply. And that's going to invoke two insert statements. I hit Apply and Finish. And now I have two users. Let's say that I want Nelson to have the role of admin and Steve to have the role of, I don't know, what role do you want? I don't know what the roles are. We, we can make them whatever we want. That's the point um, of this. Action movies? Okay. He gets the role of action movie. <laughs> so what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to open up my roles table. Hit select rows. And I'm going to add in two roles, admin and action movies. Then I'm going to hit apply and apply. We now have two rows in our roles. Two rows in our roles. Say that 10 times. <laughs> the first role, admin, has an ID of 1, and the second role, action movies, has an ID of 2. But right now, our roles and users are completely disconnected. Right? Correct. Um, we have users, we have roles, but they're in, they're in no way associated with each other. So let's go ahead and jump into our roles users table and insert a couple columns. Now, the role users table in MySQL, um, in, um, MySQL Workbench is not going to actually allow me to insert any data into this interface because I don't have a primary key. So I'm going to have to use a direct SQL statement to insert data into it, but that's fine. I'm simply going to say insert into role users, user ID, role ID, values, user ID of one, role ID of one. Hit Control Enter, and we see that this row was inserted. So now Nelson is added to the admin role. Let's go ahead and add Steve to the action movie role. So remember, Steve has a user ID of two. Action movie role has an ID of two. 
which means I need to insert a user ID of two and a role ID of two. Hit enter, or control enter, sorry, and we get another row. Now let's go ahead and say that Nelson is also in the action movies role. Well, I can go ahead and say one, because one is my user ID, and for two, instead, or I'll leave two, because two is the ID of action movies. So I hit control enter, and we now have another row inserted. So if I open up role users, we now have this little matrix right here that tells the system what user IDs are associated with what roles. So that's cool, but let's look a little bit more about our foreign key constraints and how they work. What do you think is going to happen, Steve, if I try to throw in a user that doesn't exist? It's... <clears throat> is it... Uh, my first intuition was to say that it's just going to break, but is it going to try to create something? Well, no. What's going to happen is it's, you're going to get an error. It says, cannot add or update a child row a foreign key constraint fails. Because remember, the role users table on its user ID column has a foreign key that says whatever value that's inside of this column, it needs to exist in the users table in his ID column. So I can only insert valid users into this table. Which means that since this is not a correct username or a user ID, it won't be inserted. Gotcha. Okay, let's talk a little bit about cascading. So right now we have users, we have two users, we have two roles, and we have three associations between the two. Let's say that I decided that, that action movies is no longer going to exist as a role, right? Okay. So I delete it. Uh, hasn't actually removed it from the database yet because I have to hit apply. When I hit apply, something is going to happen. Because I have the foreign key constraint set up on my role users table to cascade on delete, when I hit apply, instead of getting an error, if I come back to my role users table, we'll see that those two roles or those two uh, role associations have been automatically removed from my database. Alrighty. Because I deleted a role, meaning that that role is no longer a valid ID, which could result in an error, but because I had the cascade set to delete, it resulted in the user role row being deleted. Gotcha. Meaning if I come here and I delete Nelson from the users and hit apply, and then apply one more time, we'll see that our role users table is now blank because the roles and the users that were associated with this table are now deleted, so therefore it's blank. Okay, so just to recap, we have put together a migration, and this will be the first migration. Any additional changes we make to the database will be made in the form of more migrations throughout the rest of this project. That'll make it very, very easy to deploy and keep our databases between development and production completely in sync. I'm going to wrap up with one last thing. I'm going to create a bat file inside of simple blog, or, or I'm just going to create one that um, runs this code. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I don't want to type that out every single time. So I'm going to create a new folder called tools. Inside of tools, I'm going to create a bat file. So I'm going to say new code file, and I'm going to call it deploy db-dev.bat. Deploy db dev dot bat is simply going to be the same command we have here, except for I'm going to have to modify the, the paths a little bit. So let me go ahead and copy and paste all this stuff out. And then I need to update the paths because we're now in one subdirectory inside of the um, project, whereas we wrote this command to be inside of the project. I just have to add a dot dot slash to every path because we're going up one. So the target is dot dot slash bin simple blog. The config path is dot dot slash web dot config. So now to migrate my database, all I need to do is I need to open up my tools folder, double click on deploy db dot dev, and we'll deploy it. Now you didn't see that, um, that flash by because I didn't execute in a command window, or you did see that flash by because I didn't execute in a command window. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just simply going to type in deploy dev.bat, hit enter, and we get the system cannot find the path specified. 
which is a good thing we're testing this. Don't you agree? I absolutely agree. And Ooh. I'm moderately boggled, but what is that? That is a character encoding issue. Is that a bomb? How did that get in there? Seriously? Yeah, I'm having some issues right now with my um with my character encoding. Um blah 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 advanced save options. Uh let's yeah, UTF-8 with signature. Let's go ahead and change this to... Um, actually, I don't care. I'm going to change this to ASCII. What's the code page for ASCII again? US really? Um, <laughs> there we go. Save it again. And there we're running. So that was just Visual Studio inserting a, a byte order mask into the front of my uh, bat file. Uh, it happens sometimes. And unfortunately, PowerShell decided to completely choke on it. There you go. And all I had to do was save it as ASCII instead. Which isn't ideal, but at least ASCII doesn't come with stupid bombs. Okay, so um, I think that just about wraps everything up. We have a fully managed database. This is a big step up for a lot of pra people practicing web development that I've seen, and this will seriously save your sanity when dealing with databases, because we no longer have to manually keep them up to date. Alrighty. That sounds awesome. That's, uh, I can't imagine how much work they'd have to put into manually updating databases all the time. Yep, they have people whose job is basically just to do that. <laughs> it's kind of and that's horrific. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so um, I think this just about wraps up the video, so we'll see you guys in a bit. Alright.